Artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hi, this is episode 107. This week, we'll conclude the interview with Ben Gertzel. Ben wrote the book, 10 Years to the Singularity, If We Really, Really Try. He also started the Singularity Net Foundation and was the chief scientist of Hanson Robotics. He says on his website that he is focused on creating benevolent superhuman AGI and applying AI to areas like medicine, blockchain, robotics, media, finance, arts, music, and on and on. AGI, of course, artificial general intelligence, which we have been talking about in the first half of the interview. He also has a PhD in mathematics and has been on the faculty in several departments of mathematics, computer science, and cognitive science in universities in the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Ben may be more focused on artificial general intelligence than anyone else in the world, and last week we talked about how he got started at that, some ways of defining or measuring AGI, and its relationship to embodiment. This week we'll continue that in some more depth and talk about the singularity. Here we go. I want to ask you for your take on something that loads of people are asking me about at the moment, the Google engineer that was suspended for claiming that their <laughs> Lambda AI was sentient. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, my first thought was this guy must be seriously mentally ill. And then <laughs> after I saw some interviews with him, I realized well, he wasn't. He was just a bit crazy in a different sort of sense. So, I mean, Lambda is a transformer neural net architecture. It's very nice transformer neural net architecture. It's smart. I'd be proud of myself if I built it. It clearly is not a sentience or a sapience or anything like that. It has no abstract understanding of what it's talking about. It cannot generalize to a significant degree beyond the data that's been fed into it. It's doing qualitatively the same thing as GPT-3 or GPT Dialog or all the other neural architectures that are out there since Bert from Google launched the Transformer Neural Net Revolution. And, you know, I sort of know the feeling that this Google engineer had and that when, when talking to the Philip K. Dick robot, which is a, one of David Hansen robots, and when talking to the Desdemona robot, which is a Hansen robot that I'm working with now who leads a rock band that I play the keyboard in, right? So she's a cool robot. When talking to these two particular robots, even though I know exactly what's behind their AI system, but they're completely not human level sentiences, I've gotten like this powerful, intuitive feeling, like, wow, there's a there, there. Like, I'm I'm really talking to the soul of Philip K. Dick. Like, Desdemona knows the feeling of this music. Like, she responded to what I was playing on the keyboard. Like, I, I had that very strong emotion. And then I'm like, okay, well, that's cool. But that's kind of like when I was a kid and I thought my little doll understood me or something, right? I mean, it's a real feeling that's a testament to the power of the human emotional. Right. Yeah, the fact that this guy who's a Google engineer could have that feeling is not surprising. The fact that he didn't then step back and say, well, that's my brain generating this feeling, but it's not reflective of what's actually going on on the other side of the computer, right? The fact that he didn't step back and realize it's his brain generating that illusory feeling is surprising. It's interesting, but it takes all types of people to make up the world, right? <laughs> And I've expected a moment like this to happen, just not this soon and not with a Google engineer. I, I can see the day coming when someone claims that an AI is sentient and the people who built it will say, no, we know every line of code in it. But then it becomes subject to some kind of empirical test, like the Turing test. Well, if you know every line of code that goes in it, is that sufficient criterion for saying it can't be sentient? It seems to me like the last people that would declare an AI to be sentient are the people who wrote it. I mean, your neurosurgeon could know every last neuron that goes into your brain, and that doesn't mean you're not sentient. <laughs> right, but I think that's why the programmers of it would be less inclined to declare it sentient before it might really be. What do you think? Seems not empirically to be the case. It seems like 
programmers are pretty eager to tout the, the brilliance of their systems. If you, <laughs> if you just, if you look at what the deep mind guys are saying about their AIs, they're pretty glowing about how close they are to AGI, even though they know exactly what's inside it. And I think part of that is that these are all learning systems, right? So, I mean, the lines of code are one thing, but just because you know the lines of code, it doesn't mean you know what the hell the connections inside the model are doing, right? And with a logical mm -hmm. reasoning system like OpenCog, okay, we know what inference rules it has, but I mean, it has data coming in and it's drawing literally trillions of complex probabilistic conclusions and we don't know what they all mean. So, I mean, just because you know every line of code, nobody knows every last node and link or, or neuron that the AI system has learned based on its experience. Those are just as mysterious to the programmer as to everybody else, right? So, I mean, I guess that, that's part of it. These systems, they're behaving in ways that the programmers didn't predict, and they're doing so based on humongous complex structures the programmers will never be able to understand, which were learned based on experience. And that's the case right now, even with systems that are not sentient, right? That's the case with Google's system. And when I apply... OpenCog system to analyze genomics data, which I'm doing a lot of now. I mean, I don't know why it thinks a certain gene is associated with longevity exactly, right? So we're using OpenCog to analyze the DNA of long-lived flies that live eight times as long as normal flies to try to understand how longevity works, and then trying to use transfer learning to port that over to humans to help solve human longevity, right? So this is narrow AI, but we're using software that we're building with AGI in mind, right? And we're using probabilistic logic reasoning systems along with neural nets, but the reasoning system builds a humongous node and link like atom space full of knowledge. It uses that to make a suggestion like, okay, maybe these genes are responsible for why the flies live so long. And it can't explain its reasoning to you in a way you can understand. It can explain its reasoning, but it's like hundreds of thousands of pages of probabilistic inferences, which you're not able to sort through, right? in that case, you can check in the lab, like you can knock out that gene in a fly and see does a fly with that combination of genes knocked out, prolong the fly's life or shorten it or something, right? So in, in that case, that's narrow AI, it's not AGI, you have a specific metric of whether your inference correct or not, but you still don't know why it did what it did. And it does feel a bit like magic, like in that case, it's like, wow, I fed in this DNA data. Yeah. I figured out, like, knock out these three genes to make the fly live longer. I have no fucking idea why the AI came up with this. It's, but just because it's beyond us doesn't mean it's generally intelligent, right? Because, I mean, Mathematica and a simple calculator can do things that are in a way beyond me also. But maybe it's a question of predictability. I mean, even though I don't know what the answer of Mathematica is going to come up with for an integral is, I know that's my limitation of mathematics, not of the computer program. But also, every software developer has had the experience of a program not doing what they expected it to. And in every case, that's been because they didn't get it right, not because the computer went off in some arbitrary direction until about now. So one... I can't tell you which company this was from, but a, a friend of mine had a startup company that was sold to a large company to do some speech and dialogue interaction. And they trained a number of neural models to do this speech and dialogue. And one time, one of their developers trained a neural model that was way better than all the other ones, but they forgot what parameters they had used for the training. No one's ever been able to replicate it. The big company is still using that uh, model, right? <laughs> which was just trained by someone who like said, well, this is 0.3, this is 0.7, and um, we're using this network architecture, and we're training on this data set, we're validating on that data set. So all the specific choices that went to getting that model led to a model that was way better at dealing with speech and dialogue in this commercial application. And they hmm. still haven't managed to replicate it, right? So there is... Very cool, this emergence, there's some appearance of magic there, but that's still different than having a system that can generalize beyond its experience and solve problems that are fundamentally different from what it was trained or programmed for. And this ability to fundamentally generalize beyond your experience is needed to be an agent in an unpredictable world because the nature of an unpredictable world is it's going to keep throwing at you stuff that's beyond your experience, right? And in something like the robot college student test, the nature of a difficult university curriculum is the instructor specifically trying to give you assignments and exams that do go beyond what you had in the textbook so that you can't just regurgitate, right? They're trying to test not just your knowledge, but they're trying to test your ability to 
generalize and extend beyond that knowledge. And we don't yet have systems that can do that. I mean, there's an open question, when is that needed, right? It may be that 99% of human jobs could be formulated in a way that doesn't need much general intelligence. I mean, now, because humans have some general intelligence, we define jobs and tasks in a way that can rely on it. But I mean, the barcode scanner at the supermarket is an example of that. Those the automatic supermarket cashiers kind of suck now, but they're getting better and better. And you can easily see how in a few years, those might work as well or better than the human cashier without applying the modicum of general intelligence that human cashiers are applying when they're doing that, right? So and maybe we could just redefine almost every job humans do in a way that doesn't need general intelligence, but just needs models that are appropriately trained and configured. Hmm. But that still doesn't equate to those models being general intelligences, right? I mean, because there's still the ability to leap beyond everything in your experience and extrapolate into the great unknown, which humans are okay at sometimes and which no current software system can really do at all. It seems so slippery to me because I was reminded of Alpha Zero and I thought, well, that didn't start out with any knowledge of Go other than the rules, but it evolved the knowledge of strategies that would allow it to win. But then is that definition of strategy is in my eye, not its. Yeah. And look at StarCraft. I mean, when DeepMind played StarCraft, there's all sorts of hacks and special things. You know, like Alpha Zero can't play StarCraft. The, the search space is too high. And you look at the game like Advanced Tactics Gold, which is a military strategy game. The branching factor of that game is like 10 to the 60th, whereas the branching factor of Go is 400 or something, right? Branching factor meaning when you have a given possibility, how many other possibilities could that lead to? So if advanced tactics gold is branching factor of 10 to the 60 versus Go is 400, you know, how big is the branching factor of actual military strategy in the real world? Like the Ukrainians are dealing with now. It's, it's going to be way, way beyond that simplified military strategy game, right? So there is a qualitatively greater amount and kind of complexity that we're dealing with in real world warfare versus a military strategy video game versus Go, which is an abstraction of military strategy versus tic-tac-toe, which is a, a very a much, much simpler abstraction, right? So I think it is not extremely precisely defined, but that doesn't mean it's meaningless. And I mean, having done a lot of work in biology, I'm fairly comfortable with things not being that precisely defined. Like nothing in biology is precisely defined. I mean, you can't, life is not precisely defined and no one gives a shit whether a virus is really life or not or a retrovirus, right? Yeah, they're at the fuzzy border of life and non-life. They have some lifelike properties, some non-lifelike properties. You just deal with it. I mean, whether a cancer is cured is not precisely defined, right? I mean, it goes in remission, it can be in a very deep remission. I mean, you, you don't need... Defining it that every last remnant of a cancerous cell is gone from the body isn't useful or necessary, and we don't know how to measure, right? So, I mean, in biology and medicine, things are just not precisely defined, yet real genuine progress is made, right? It's not all bullshit because it's not precisely defined. Right. I think AGI, to an extent, is a bit more like that and for similar reasons because you're talking about human-like general intelligence, and that's particular in the same sense that Earth biology is particular. You're studying a particular class of evolved systems, and you're studying engineered systems that are roughly emulating that particular class of evolved systems. And that's just, it's a mess yeah. and fuzzy thing to be doing. You and I are not precisely defined, and yet we still manage to get stuff done. Yes. You wrote about something called a digital baby brain once, and I'm wondering where that plays into this discussion. Yeah, so... Well, I do think there are many paths to AGI. I think there's going to be an interesting role to play for artificial toddlers, right? And this is my excuse for uh, keeping on to reproduce and having uh, five kids. I've got a four-year-old and a one-year-old now because it's amazing to watch them grow and learn and see how these young minds mm -hmm. go from understanding almost nothing. You know, already my 15-month-old understands pretty much what you need to understand about the everyday human world, even though she can only talk like three or four word sentences, right? So, I mean, there, there's mm -hmm. a lot of just learning to model the world that human children do and we take for granted. I mean, the development, of course, is complicated. And they have different functions whose release is triggered at different ages based on what they've perceived and what they've learned to do in their environment. But I think it will be very interesting to take 
a proto AGI system and put it in, say, an artificial preschool type situation and have it sort of learn to see and manipulate and socialize and move and build and draw and identify words with objects and go through all this just like a very young human child does. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that's the only golden path to AGI, but I think it's a very interesting path. It would be very interesting to take a reasonably capable artificial toddler that became like a AGI two or three-year-old and then plug its brain together with your deep neural language model that understands the whole web, plug its brain together with your bioinformatics model that can crunch genomics data, right? Because you can't do that with a human, but with different proto-AGI systems. Hmm. I mean, you could cross-link their minds. So then maybe the artificial toddler gives the creativity and then it's wired in with these other more domain-specific narrow AIs, and you're getting some sort of mind flex of, of different components. And I'm quite interested in doing that in a game world context, as well as a robot context. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be either or. But with robots, the actuators are just kind of bad still, right? Whereas uh, mm. in a video game world, that doesn't matter. So we're, I mean, we're doing some ex simple experiments in our... OpenCog team within my overall singularity net blockchain based AI project. So with the OpenCog team, which is focused on AGI R D, we're experimenting with AI agents learning and doing simple things in the Minecraft world. And then we're building a couple of more fully featured virtual worlds. One is the say uh, Sophia's Age of Singularities metaverse, which will have avatar versions of the Sophia robot roaming around doing cool things. And there's a Singularity Net 3D metaverse. So we're building more fully featured virtual worlds. And it'll be really cool to have sort of baby AGI minds romp around in there. So we're, we're making a new version of our OpenCog neural symbolic AGI system, which is called OpenCog Hyperon, which is architected for greater speed and scalability and for compatibility with the AGI chip we're working on. So, I mean, one of the main things I want to do with this new version of OpenCog, this Hyperon system, as it develops, is test it out on, you know, controlling swarms of baby-style agents in Minecraft and then in our own Singularity and, and Sophia metaverses. And I think you can get a long way that way, but also... You know, we're using OpenCog behind the Sophia Grace Desdemona robots already. So, I mean, once the system has learned cool things about how to perceive and manipulate and socially interact in a virtual environment, you know, can you get the system to transfer learn some of that to help with the humanoid robots to do things in their environments? Or maybe you can use this learning in the virtual world to sort of jumpstart the learning of a robot in the physical world. And the, some things you can't jumpstart. I mean, just physical manipulation of objects is just different and harder in the physical world than in the virtual world. But navigation, I would say, yes, you know, embodied social interactions, the rules of social engagement, teamwork, probably works pretty well from a virtual world to the physical world. And there's a lot of interesting questions here of how pure do we want to be in these virtual world experiments? Like, do you make the system learn language from teaching it, like point to a block in the Minecraft world and say, that's a block and pile two blocks up. That's a block on top of a block. So we're doing that. We're pointing things out and giving natural language descriptors. The question is, do you do that in the context of a system that has no understanding of language? Or do you just give it some transformal neural net models and then like neural symbolic language models and involving logical model of language and a transformer and let it learn this is a block, this is a tower of blocks. Let it learn to ground these transformer neural symbolic language models in the Minecraft world, but based on the priming from these external neural models. And but both kinds of experiments are interesting. I'm personally hoping the impure method would work just for sake of efficiency and time, right? Because I have no doubt you could teach a neural symbolic open code system everything about language just from repeated interactions in Minecraft and our own metaverses. It just seems laborious and time consuming. <laughs> so, if, I mean, if you could prime it with the language models we have already and use virtual worlds to ground, allow the language models to get some symbol grounding, then put that into robots. That's sort of feeling maybe like 
shortcuts cascading on shortcuts, right? Which is right. maybe what you need to get there in the time that Ray Kurzweil has a lot of those. Lots of questions. I want to ask about the Singularity Net Metaverse. Can anyone get in this? Describe it to us. No one can get in it yet because we haven't launched it yet. We're building it now. So there's a number of aspects there. And what I just described, we've been focusing on the AGI aspect, obviously. So we're creating a 3D virtual world that you can access with goggles and such, but also access just the regular software application. And you can get an avatar and you can roam around in there and do things. I mean, there's a blockchain-based aspect in that the Singularity Nets AGIX cryptographic token is like the in-game currency there. There's an NFT aspect where you can build art and sell NFTs. And the, there's also a very interesting neuro AI aspect in that we're using neural models to generate world content. So you can like describe what you want your avatar to look like, like a three-headed dragon with red scales. And then we use a neural net to generate the avatar. Or you can describe a building, like I want a big tower with large wooden doors and a slide. And then the neural net model will generate that structure for you in the world. And this, this is neural AI. It's not AGI, right? I mean, that's right. models trained on natural language together with 2D image, together with 3D structures. It's fairly sophisticated. But it, that will, having a bunch of people playing in the world, generating amazing content, using neural nets, but then using their own human sensibility to decide which of the neural productions to keep or throw out, right? I mean, this results in a very interesting world for non-player character avatars to roam around and play in, right? And there'll be some NPC avatars that are simplistic neural AIs, but also some that are running OpenCog Hyperon, roaming around in that world learning stuff. And so this, right? we're playing with Minecraft now because it's there and we're seeing that our reasoning systems can solve long-range planning problems much better than deep reinforcement learning, which is interesting. But in the end, Minecraft is a very repetitive and simplistic world. And we're thinking that something that's just richer in the kinds of structures that are in there and richer in the social interactions that happen in there can be interesting for training young AGI minds. And of course, there's interoperability. The AI characters should be able to romp between Minecraft and Singularity Metaverse and Second Life or Decentraland or something. What is your goal for the Metaverse you're building there? What's wild success look like in your eyes? Well, the Singularity Metaverse has multiple goals. So, I mean, the proximal goal for Singularity Net platform is really this is just, it's going to be the new interface for Singularity Net as an AI services marketplace. So, I mean, Singularity Net as a project is not just about AGI. Its long range goal is to catalyze emergence of beneficial decentralized AGI. But I mean, Singularity Net, it's a protocol that uses blockchain to allow collections of AI agents to provide services to customers and to cooperate to solve problems with each other without any central controllers. So it's like a decentralized swarm of AI agents where blockchain is used to enable decentralized coordination and control. And Right now, this is a back-end protocol you can use by connecting to its APIs, or we have a very simple like web-based showcase on Singularity Net website where you can go and see a few simple AI agents that are deployed in the marketplace and try them out. So we want to replace that web-based showcase with a metaverse showcase for AI agents. And we, from a business standpoint, we want to make Singularity Net the sort of one-stop shop for AI for the metaverse. So anyone who wants AI mm -hmm. characters, AI to build structures, anything AI related for a virtual world, we want to provide the best AI services for a virtual world through Singularity Net platform. And then you go in the metaverse to try them out. You can then use them to build stuff for any virtual world that you have. So that's Singularity Net as a blockchain-based AI platform, right? And that's its own thing. Now, OpenCog Hyperon, which is an AGI project, that it's an open source project anyone can contribute to, but currently funded substantially by the Singularity Net and worked on by Singularity Net team members. Right? From an OpenCog standpoint, I mean, we're looking at this to be the playground for the toddler AGI, right? And then, of course, once you have a toddler AGI, then I think you're not too far off from ascending beyond that level because my own right. view is the bottleneck we got to reach is the level of generalization common sense and imagination that a bright two-year-old has 
I mean, I think my one-year-old has it already, but I'm, I'm a proud father, right? So we'll, mm. we'll, let's, let's say a bright two or three. Me but, too. And because they have that ability to learn and build their learning systems. Yeah, they can adapt to a fundamentally new context, right? And they can create and imagine. And my, you know, my one-year-old is already making up stories and trying to tell them in her halting brief sentences, right? So they, they can make up narratives. They can play pretend games in their head all day, even though they can't communicate them that right. well until they're a little older. And if you put them in a Native American tribe, I mean, they're going to adapt, right? I mean, if you put them in a society of Stone Age... Amazonian natives, which is running around hunting with a bow and arrow and hunting and gathering, like a, a two-year-old kid within weeks is going to become a native of that Amazonian tribe, right? I mean, they're right. they're adapting in a way faster than we are. So They're amazing at that. I wanted to finish up with talking about the singularity because it's a yeah, topic yeah. that just tends to not let you go uh, to anything less than that afterwards. And of course, you've got singularity in that you've got... T- your book, 10 Years to the Singularity. And and yet singularity is originally a mathematical term. It's an abstraction. So what does it mean in a concrete sense? What will the singularity look like, feel like, sound like? I mean, a singularity in math is really just a point discontinuity, right? So, I mean, in yeah. in general relativity, in gravity theory, that's sort of a point with a space-time continuum breaks down and becomes discontinuous. And then the Einstein equations don't apply at that point anymore. If you're drawing a curve, like a tangent curve or something, the singularity is where the curve slope becomes infinite. You can't take the derivative. So that's, of course, whether that occurs in the physical universe is a vexed question, right? In general relativity, the singularities tend to occur in the middle of a black hole where you can't see them. But there's a notion of a naked right. singularity no one knows if those exist in space. Or yeah. So what Ray Kurzweil was thinking when he introduced the term singularity was that technology is progressing exponentially faster and faster and faster so that the slope of the curve of technological progress is becoming effectively infinite. Right. Well, it's a metaphor in that he's not really trying to say the slope will become infinite, but he's trying to say it's going to go so fast that it's going to look like it's becoming infinite. And you know, my friend Damien Broderick, who's a great science fiction writer, he wrote a nonfiction book in the late 90s called The Spike, which was basically just like The Singularity is Near, perhaps better written from a literary standpoint. Damien's a great writer, but a bit earlier, so it never caught on, right? So The Spike evidently was not as poetic as The Singularity, and The Singularity as a term caught on, perhaps because mm. of that illusion of infinity, which isn't quite there, right? But I think people need some idea of how to latch on to this because we're coming from this place of a mathematical abstraction. What would it be like if the singularity was here now? If your phone is making a half dozen Nobel Prize level science discoveries every five minutes, you're probably well into a singularity, right? So, I mean, that's not infinite, but that's so fast relative to the way our human, like we couldn't understand them, right? And then there's a new one coming before we started to understand the last one. So if the rate of technological progress and invention and creation is so fast that it appears and feels infinite relative to our human minds, then that's really what Kurzweil meant by a singularity. Like it might as well be infinite relative to us. It's like if a guy is running past you so fast you can't see him, it doesn't matter mm. if it was infinite or, or just 88 billion miles an hour from a qualitative standpoint. Anyway, that that's sort of the thinking behind the meaning of the term. To me, I mean, yeah, it's more of an evocative than a precise term. I know I.J. Good, who I mentioned before, had the term intelligence explosion. And that, in a way, is a more precise term, right? There, at least you're saying general intelligence is increasing at an exponential pace until it's gotten far beyond the human level. And I think functionally, those two are close to the same thing. Because I think once you get the intelligence explosion, where AGI is far beyond the human level, then AGI is going to make all manner of new inventions much, much faster than humans could do or even understand. And I mean, then you're into the domain of a technological singularity and really an experiential singularity also, because you know, what it's going to be like to plug with a brain computer interface, these super AIs into your brain. I mean, this will lead to experiences 
beyond what we can envision, right? Right. But at that point, with those brain-computer interfaces, maybe it wouldn't be so infinite to us. We would be able to catch up. It would be infinite to a legacy human. It might not be mm. infinite to whatever humans have evolved into by that point in time. And whether we call that future version of a human still a human or not is a somewhat irrelevant semantic question, I suppose. Well, clearly we could go on for so much longer with this. Do you want to give us a prediction of the year when you will declare that we have AGI? I'm going to say my uh, optimistic prediction is 2026. My pessimistic prediction wow. is 2033. So I'm going to put a four-year confidence interval on, on Ray Kurzweil's 2029 estimate. Got it. Thank you. So how can people who are listening to this excited have resources or time or interest, find out more, get involved with the seemingly infinite number of things that you're doing? Well, if you look at singularitynet.io, that has links to a bunch of different blog posts and websites and so forth. You can go to my personal website, gertzel.org as well, and that has links to my various doings. If you're deep in the technical side, you can search for OpenCog Hyperon and you can find some wiki pages and GitHub repos on that. You can also find that from the other sites I mentioned by digging a bit. So there's plenty of resources out there and almost all the software projects I'm working on now, all the ones I've mentioned today are open source and we're eager for folks to get involved and uh, help us create a beneficial singularity in AGI and all that good stuff. Oh, fantastic. I'm sure that there'll be some people listening to this who've got those kind of skills might be very interested in taking part. Ben Gertzel, thank you very much for coming on AI and You. Well, thank you. It's been a great conversation. That's the end of the interview. Ben Shore is putting a stake in the ground on that prediction. What do you think? And how would you break down what parts of AGI are going to show up first? In today's news ripped from the headlines about AI... Google has a new tool to help job seekers prepare for interviews, and it is, of course, AI. A posting last month from Jesse Haynes, the director of Grow with Google, which is a whole division for helping people improve their skills, says they have a new tool called Interview Warm-Up, which transcribes your interview answers in real time and points out things that you might want to improve. You can do this in a practice interview that it will lead. Search for Google Interview Warm-Up and you can try it for yourself. So I did. I haven't done this in a while. It asked me some questions, including a variation on the tell us about your greatest mistake, and it did a good job of transcribing my answers. I wasn't so impressed with its analyses, though. It was useful, perhaps, for it to say that I hadn't talked about goals or interests when asked to say a bit about myself, although those came in later answers. But when it asked what I would do about someone on my team hypothetically wanting to give a contract to their brother and I said I would report them to the ethics department, I wasn't impressed that it said that it couldn't detect any talking points at all in my answer. But it is early days yet, and we do know that Google improves their products as people use them. Next week, we're going to stay out on the edges of the future and speculation when I talk with Robert J. Sawyer, leading Canadian science fiction writer and author of the WWW series, Wake, Watch and Wonder, Rob writes a lot about the nature of consciousness, identity, and how technology could mess with our fixed ideas of those things. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles at AINU.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U.net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.